the indwelling by Zebra. The spirits come at night, Baca instructed over the sound of a rattle, and they enter in here. His arm curved in an upward-backward C, and he stuck his tongue out and twisted his brows when the pointer finger small palm touched his black-haired bandana's backside, patting it a few times for emphasis. The children were unsure whether or not to be spooked yet. The fire cracked and spit into the omnipresence mosquito's direction. An understudy of Baca's had a snakeskin bound leather journal in his lap, like one of the ones a conqueror would bring with them, amidst their other offerings, namely Christianity, or what was left of it, colonial food that tasted worse than the berries that the young local girls collected, and apart from equal parts dis-ease and disease, a lot of talk left over about how they all really still owe them a favor. The mineral exports and hacking of trees was apparently insufficient. His name was Placota, the one who wrote down each and every word that Baca rang out in the central circle of huts in La La Land, more specifically the village Snooze. To Placota, the wrinkled sleepman's stories and fantastical claims were not just busy-keeping ingredients which enlivened each week's rattle night, but chronicles of wisdom itself on the high end, tips of a helpful friend on the low end, but the sort of friend who held all manner of prestigious accomplishment, not most impressively with task, but their progress in the art of just being oneself. The elder Sweetman and I have been trying to determine what the intent is of these spirits who enter into our bodies when the moon is high on the great pelican's hash, and we slumber peacefully waiting for the permission of the rooster to arouse ourselves again. Less obscurely, Placota recalled, Baca had once looked at him with a very profound, ineffable sort of look, and told him in the way that co-conspirators in ancient Rome's empire must have communicated with one another. That is, as if someone was watching them, but the information was too important to house privately. They are the governors of our world, Placota. The way Baca had said it made them sound like tyrants. A tyranny ruled from within our own bodies, Pakoda had thought grimly. That can't be good. Some nightland creature had made a noise somewhere on the critter spectrum between owl and wolf, and Baca had then withdrew, startled. On another occasion, the elder had seemed more confident in the intentions of the indwelling visitors, and just as cryptically as on the inverse occasion had spoken as much, they wear the horned mask as a sacrifice. It's part of a greater design. Pakoda, taking all these numerous occasions together as a bundle, the time puddles, in step of which his idol and teacher, often the two are paired, had spoken on the subject of the indwelling visitors, the fuzzy addition of all the different positions Baca had taken on what was a living problem, a puzzle that changes according to its position in time, as our bodies do. The living problem of self-invasion from mysterious beings. He, as Baca continued tonight's sermon, pieced together inside the best summary as breezes blew tufting twigs and long leaves around. The indwellers come into the body by first introducing a mental signal. The mental signal, or thought feeling, is mistaken as one of the host creations, a piece of their own authentic thought life, and the host buys in or proceeds down the line of that introduced signal, and eventually the mysterious force is inhabiting that body by convincing that body that it, the visitor, was it, the body. That much, their method, was clear from the composite diagram of spoken word that Placota had amassed through his experiences of old Baca. It was their intention behind invading the species that was more murky and still unresolved, both for the tribe and the individual, or Baca. In a stringy plant-made palm chair, across the pit fire and flash and flicker camp light, another elder, Skari, whose specialty in snooze pertained to social organization, taming slash order, 
conferred with Trismicus, the sleepman specialite of yo yoga, a physical exercise designed to clear the practitioner of indwellers, Baca says. And what only registered to the children, Baca and Pakoda, as less audible than a distant brush fart emanating from the deep wood. And then the elder of organization turned towards Baca and also the fire and said, For five sleepman cycles, you and your father Boko and his father Biki, and well, I'm sure you know the shamanic lineage that you yourself represent for us, and we thank you for that. But it's the rest of the council's hope that we can speak freely on this matter. Your family has been almost exclusively preoccupied with understanding and warning us all of these er beings since the beginning of our settlement. And there are those among us, I won't say who, that not only feel that your time, Brother Baca, could be best spent in divining potions from the tree folk, or identifying psychic maladies and curses aimed our way by neighboring factions. But further, some of us wonder whether or not there may be any of these beings at all. It was a stabbing but necessary statement. For the opinion of the anonymous sleepman on the council was also reflected amongst a wide majority of Snooze's population, but no one dare challenge Baca under ordinary seasons because he may not supply them with their weekly ration of snuff. Is that so? Baca, Baca uttered at the mud floor, then withdrew into a silence that spoke, saying nothing more. There was a sore of certainty, and even that isn't the right word, but an insurance a knowing, an unwaveringness about Baca's stance on the matter. Being questioned pointedly on its truth value produced the same unaffected shrugging that asking some body whether they were lying about the presence of toes in their boots would produce in that body. They would simply wiggle their stubs and laugh. In other words, just like the philosophical question of the ontological reality of feet and miniature feet is no longer an open area of inquiry for any body that is not a slug, the reality or lack of reality of the visitors was second or even first nature to Baca, and he was far ahead of them in this region of the world, evidently, because they were still uncertain and thus ignorant of the presence of the spirits at all. They needed convincing, which is another way of saying they didn't know one way or the other. And because it wasn't panning out materially or ideally for them, providing them with spells from learned oaks or fending off bewitchments from surrounding outcrops of other kinds of men, they had opted to cut corners in their own investigatory advents and to just decide, as so many do when faced with the secrets of creation, to decide basically for their non-existence. Flustered, the grump of the elder sweetman, and thus the one with the most power or ascribed social influence, Jakiri, burst out like a pine cone detonated by remote charges, at a volume at which even hunting hawks would flock and flutter off elsewhere. <clears throat> Yes, Baka, it is so, it is so, and you are going to have to accept that it is so, because under power granted to me by the celestial serpent. At that, Pakoda laughed in disbelief, as all laughter is in, and snarled, You mean your father? Then a different variety of silence, not a silence that invites reflection like Baca's, but one that comes from sleepmen need to reel from something unheard of, usually a challenge to establish an unestablished authority. Those silences happen everywhere, are always hints that someone or something has amassed and taken in too much power, ascribed social influence. Popping in and up whenever and wherever a surf or someone too young and therefore pitiful speaks up against someone who's been alive long enough to be miserable about it. But invariably when serfs or the children of snooze in this iteration are exposed to one of their caste insubordination towards their subliminal oppressors, the higher-ups, they just reel, 
which is what these silences are for, as mentioned. But they reel in from fear, from fear that their compadres' revolt will be chalked up to their doing also. And they secretly feel this way because they feel exactly how their friend, the revolutionary, is feeling deep down. But haven't yet come upon the inner reserves they need that are always there waiting to stand up in that way. And so they discourage the standing up of their ally, because if the big boss, the higher up of whichever kind, should punish all of them, and not just the one, well, then they would be forced to stand up as well. On this basis and this basis alone, hierarchy has remained operative for ages and ages, a system of better and worse, wise and dumb, which is incompatible with the actual forms of nature, which are so designed to each be an entirely unique spit shape from the saliva of untapped cosmic creativity, and each their own elder, and each their own understudy, each never owned and never owning. Any rubric or tradition which teaches elsewise is delusional. Baca had instinctively put his arm across Pakoda at his outburst, as if hanging the limb over him might kill two birds. One, shield him from the touchy anger of his insulted elder, and two, plug block any further flow of residual angst from seeping out of the pus of the burst wound of Pakoda's complacency, his always being too young to be heard. Child, Jakiri reminded as if doing a service for the young sweet men. May I encourage you to be lucid on whom you speak to, each word fighting its way into a force calm to veil the fragile pride of the grump elder. I taught your father how to hear the plans of salmon and how to know if a buffalo has given permission to become food. My years are as numerous as the fleas on your younger sister. Hurt giggles squeak out from the other serfs of adolescent present among them. In order to signify the agreement they don't really have, but would like to present with the old man's words. And I once slept with your mother. Pakoda jumped up as if a nip-nip ant had found a way for its tiny teeth to sink into the under rump of his bum. And then he, or something inside of him, restrained the motion, and he sat himself. Jakiri appeared pleased through the upward drifting horizontal wall of smoke tufts. Your passions are untamed, child. Perhaps you could learn from my words. Pakoda wasn't convinced. The only difference separating his half punch and Jakiri's mild reaction to having his role among them challenged was that Jakiri had managed to be seen to look on the outside as if he hadn't suffered upset, while Pakoda's pain had been displayed visibly. The only difference between their skills was that Shakiri had power, and that word he knew meant about the same gist as simply constant crafting a face for others to see in their own minds, and the power spoke nothing to what lay lurking in both of these men beneath the grand fib. Baca had at some point shifted the coals in his sockets to be aimed in the general direction of the flashing oars in Shakiri's sight arsenal and had not moved an inch in where his coals were aimed, staring far beyond a comfortably endured duration of rattle night talk time. The night each cycle where the general state of the general states of each sweetman were pool considered and then decided by a small few of them to be the central foci of the group path for the next cycle. That decision, expected by the elders to be integrated into each and every action of the young from then on, or until their next decision on the next full moon. Jakiri, again with pretend pretense, glitched and shook a bit when he returned from facing Bakoda to the, the severe stare of his fellow, but less powerful council sweetman Baka. It only took a millisecond's little hand to be replaced by an equally severe stare back at him. Having had all the practice Shakiri has had as part of the small village snoozes decision makers, decisions made by the makers for those too inept by their evaluation to ever decide on what mattered to them. Practice in 24-7 self-surveillance of one's outside from the inside. To always be wiping away blemishes in facial expression that might hint that he, Shakiri, the grump and thus the most powerful, which can also be translated into most forceful, had even felt an inch of either self-doubt or intimidation. 
The powerful amongst men and sweet men must always appear unlike those who they reign, and the decisive, decisive by truth standards, not those of dying old men, distinction, that they are never afraid like the, like the village folk. As I was saying, with respect, Baka, the elders always use the add-on with respect when addressing each other to signal that they really felt of the opponent's views that they amounted to a pile of bullshit. But because they had the kindness to act as if those views are respectable, that whatever was about to be said in response should be considered very carefully. It isn't that we sweet folk don't appreciate the services of your family in our lineage and are pursuing the established group path of each cycle and snooze here. Of course we do. It has been... This type of silence signifies that one doesn't mean really the next thing, but feels obliged. Invaluable. But we... Jukiri looked at the other four council sweet men present. Skari, Trismikis, Lotus, and Bel Arisma, one sweet woman of four, who all nodded in a way that made it obvious to anybody really observing them that they had been at another previous time and place arm wrestled into this nodding ahead of time, and didn't so much affirm as had to affirm what their grump king was saying. We, the Slumber Council, find that your talents are better spent in traditional and therefore good medicine activities. We urge you, officially, Jakiri looked at the four again, as to signal a need for backup that his words really could be called official, and they had to nod again heavily like bricks were on the back of their necks. To cease all investigation into the indwellers, these spirit beings you claim we need to know about and combat but whose reality we elders have not yet been convinced of. And in the interest of the group path, to resume primary work on antidotes for python venom immediately. Any evidence that you have been operating out there in that funky, small little hut on the town border of snooze, on the problem of the indwellers, will be handled with a communal trial and will possibly result. The Grump King had been waiting for this part. It was the threat that gave his words, whether they were true or not, an impetus or push of enforcement. And he liked that, the Grump King. Oh, he had always liked that. Impermanent exile to the deep wood. The gathering serfs, who were comparing their hand flats and the spark flickering sharp bright glow sphere of the town fire to the memory of what they had looked like in the sunlight during the day before, a day which in snooze would not be called a day, but an opening. For them of the more rainforest, the wider world where the conquerors sailed and now flew from, and also the widest, perhaps even multi-universe cosma that they were born from, all consisted of quasi-anatomical rhythms of opens and shuts. The shift into morning from night was not a notch on a calendar, but the in and out breaths of a master organism, of which each sweet man is only a cell. So, a day opens is an opening of some unseen heart valve or capillary or vein hole in the master organism, and a consequent letting in of nutrients from another region of the master's body of all bodies, another system, was noted to their astonished eyes as daytime and nighttime was when this part of the big bod ceased being an input and became an output, and all the sunlight, the nutrients, drain out and go to nourish a neighboring settlement in the deep wood, or perhaps closer in the shallow wood. But still, this is how their world works. Due most likely not to its alleged accuracy or alleged inaccuracy, but to a blunt mixture of the two. Some truth, as always, had snuck into their stories, and some of the grand fib, as always, was at work on their own understanding of their own myths, and would confuse them as to how much truth had actually been accounted for by their tales, so that the value provided by the truth was lost to them. The serfs looked up from their layered sight of grass background containing hands, and then layered behind them their toes sniffing the air like mice searching for delights after a long dormancy. And realizing that they were supposed to both agree with Jakiri's judgment and also or seem as usual a bit more shocked and ideally odd as always by his power, which they, of course, had given him and gave to him still. That is, they should look blown over with the firmness of his judgment's deliverance or else. 
Weeders always require displays of the greatness that they are well aware of not having. So, as requested subtly, and all power makes its request subtly, by the way, that way, any totalitarian qualities in regards to the sort of power the powerful or forceful have are hidden by not demanding directly, but disguising each demand as a loaded question, designed to make the serfs felt heard by, the, by their authorities, and grateful for the opportunity to express again what the authorities may or may not have actually understood by not listening to them. There were sweet kids ooing and looking over at Baca, waiting to see what he, who had the craziest, meaning most unhinged, meaning free personality, amongst all of Snooze a sweet men and sweet women, and could be expected to surprise expectations always with his holy humor. Humor that doesn't consider consequences, but speaks the heart's true feeling. Baca seemed chill, relaxed, prepared to do what he had to do, with or without the common knowledge of his peer counselors, which he knew to be less in the know in matters such as that of the indwellers, and also in regards to their self-development and truth relationship in general. And so, even if diplomatically, which just means where everyone can see, he agreed to the Grump King's request, which was the Grump King's and not the council's, Baca was well aware. He would tacitly, behind curtains, out of view on the town's edge, doubtlessly decide for himself, decide in the way that all the serfs were too frightened to do for themselves. Yet, anyways, they assure themselves of that, that someday they'll have the power for bravery. But of course, that is the coward in them making excuses, excuses for tomorrow, written down on a calendar that they don't even keep, the calendar of the conquerors. Despite any executive orders, even from Sister Jaguar herself, Baca would make that call. Baca would do his experiments. And if there was something there, even Pakoda was hard to admit that to himself, of the uncertainty of whether there were spirit at all. Baca would not stop until he understood that something. And if those indwelling visitors came as a threat, Baca would save all of them. And if the indwellers came to heal, then he would alleviate them of their worries. To the contrary, concern of bad luck in being visited and inhabited. He looked at Jakiri and said, You want me to make medicine. I will make red clay salve and heal a young child's knee scrape. A good deed, yes, Brother Jack, but so small, so not enough. We are faced with a disease that is greater than anything that the conquerors carried over on their unwashed genitals. A disease greater than any one cycle before us. A sleep, I tell you, Jacques, which will end all cycles and replace them with something new. Based on the knowledge I have, which for I have uh, sane reasons, I assure you, kept largely veiled of these mysterious beings, uh, that every cycle will end, is that that's a guarantee. There are things we are going to see which have never happened before in any of the phases of the Big Bod's evolution, in any of the morphalizing periods of growth in the Big Bod's tissues and fabric, in any time ever timed ever. He paused to swallow a cocoa leaf, as well as the fact that nothing he was saying, even so grave for the loin-covered rabbit bunchkins living in mud huts out here in the shallow wood was being taken seriously, which is one way of saying being acknowledged at all. And you, Jacques, are preventing us from addressing it. Did the serpent give you that right to... Enough, Baka! Jakiri countered by shushing in a split hair. That's enough now. There is no more discussion of these invisiting entities. We have made our vote. Pakoda thought, no. You have made the vote for all of us, and we have sat here and done nothing. And the elders will accept any possible but unlikely cataclysm that ought might occur from our rulings. If that is all, uh, I would like for us to discuss the issue of whether or not we should allow sweep children to take apprenticeships with the conquerors in Nowhere City, as more than one of them have asked. And that topic is well picked because it relates to what I would like to be our group path for this next coming cycle. 
Pakoda thought, again, not said, but thought, as a serf of adolescence should, someone without a viable opinion who best listened to those who pierced the age bracket and acquired one. If Baka is right, there will be no more next cycle, and all of your plans for, will be for a future we don't have, for a type of living that we can't sustain. Which, I'm happy to say, is economic expansion. At that term, a hungry look overshadowed the shame at having gone over Baka's head and the other four elders' eyes. Evidently, this related to why they had agreed to skewer Baka's long-term fascination. Evidently, here is where they stood to gain something greater than his continued trust in confiding with any one of them. We feel that the presence of the conquerors may be an opportunity in disguise, and that we ought to accept what pleasures we can quietly gain from their occupation, because we have already lost the fight to avoid their displeasures. This caused a dual shock. One zap in Pakoda, nearly knocking his tree bark and rabbit fuzz crafted scarf from around his forehead. Discussed that the elders would just give up, give up the sleepman way entirely, and also the drive to run them back out, back to the festering Yerspleen blister that they must have crawled out of like maggots. And his other shock was that Baka wasn't... Wait a second. Baka must understand this, Plakota reflected gingerly, soothing his outrage with an attempt to coolly unmask the invisible population of all not being said aloud clambering about all of them gathered there, and upon reading that second secret script of the situation, to make good then as why to be outraged or not, because if the words not being said aloud told him something he hadn't known about all this, then maybe he would realize it was more strategic for his and Baca's ends, the ends of the individual, the path of the single, not the group, or the group as determined by the grump, to stifle the impulse before spearing that grump king where he sat. An impulse that Pakoda recognized with timid tiptoe steps in its general vicinity, as really being there in him, as in he or something in the whole him, real genuinely would have liked to spear his elder, his lifetime town authority. But it wasn't malice's province of feeling that generated the urge, in fact it was love, love disguised. He admitted like a confession to himself that he loved the sweetmen, the same ones who laughed when he defended himself to their lord, presented as a friend. The very sweet boyo and sweet blassie who turned away when Jakiri had either fabricated or revealed a tryst with his mums, long since gone, raped and burned by the invaders. Yes, he loved them, and maybe Lakota glanced over at Baka, the reliable guiding blue jay tweets that lead travelers astray from the deep wood back to safekeeping are in Baka, that same guidance, and this could be why. They both loved the sleepmen, no matter how their personal arrangements were with one another. The rattle night concluded with an announcement that the sweep children would indeed be allowed passage to Nowhere City, and there they would hammer steel and stalls and serve pudding in aged but refurbished diners for the conquerors. The Grump King promised that the singular and unmatched arts and crafts of the sweepmen would come to be valued by the invading race, and that their isolation in the wildness virtually guaranteed that these arts and crafts particular to their own cycles and their own experience could and would not be duplicated by another shallow wood settlement such as Snore or Shut Eye. Snooze will be prosperous, seemed to be the premier takeaway of the declaration. And the subtle unheard proclamation, the one that only those words which aren't said can tell a listening ear, was that prosperity now meant for all of them exactly what it had meant for their conquerors when they had come. Gold, cash, destruction in the interests of comforts and feel goods, probably excessive sex and untastely unrefined drugs too. Material mass is what it came down to. A sleepman would no longer be rich here in Snooze for having just had Sister Jaguar speak with her or him personally in a dream. They would wake each opening in poverty despite the riches that their non-gross but subtly physical visions heralded. Because they no longer had enough shit. Because the old grump from a dying time said so, and they all let him. On the walk back to Baca's mud hut, 
He had told Pakoda something very alarming. He told Pakoda that it wasn't the town grump Jakiri or even the four others, Trismicus, Bel Ariasma, Lotus, and Skari, who had put forth this new policy, but that their forms had been captured by the indwelling visitors, and that it was those spirits who spoke for the elder sweetmen, not the sweetmen themselves, who had been reduced to puppets. And the showman that this shaman was, he seemed less troubled by the possession of his fellows than chin-stroked and excited in some odd sense, excited by things to come that never had come before, an excitement that only individuals like he and his undersay Placota would ever know. Everyone else feels shivers crawl up anticipating when the opening or closing of that week or weekend day, to use white speak, offers them a cookie. Whether that cookie is in the shape of a gift or a woman wasn't that point. They, they only knew how to be excited about the immediate, while individuals could and had always been struck by an excitement for the growth process of the superorganism itself. The events of the day, or gestation of the big bod's organs, became unremarkable when one, as a blood cell in the body of all bodies, caught glimpses and hints of the direction of the overall movement. Seeing that Snooze's council had been infiltrated and replaced from within his cohort's bodies, was such a peeking for Baca into the true overall situation. Were small time happenings and this or that opening blurred with all times and all places and the all happening, it made him feel like the hero he had harbored since crawling into the fern grove from his mama bear's cave, covered in goo, might finally be put to some use. But, Pakota said, stepping over a dead stick with the above river washing half in view over his shoulders and some thick wood behind them, if he wasn't Jakiri and was one of the indwelling visitors, then why do I still see the man Jakiri and not the enemy as it is? He had a correct feeling about the answer as it was asked, as we so often do but ignore to carry on the play of conversation. But he still offered his father figure Baka a look that said, You know better. Baka, being wise, didn't make much of those looks, because he knew that somewhere in Pakoda's sleepman shape, he was the one that knew better than himself, or whatever was inside of him, thinking that it was him for him. Baca muttered under the ever symphony of native bull toad croaks and insect wire darting jagged lasers everywhere. Placota, the man you saw as Jakiri was Jakiri, but the being who looked out at you and me and the children from Jakiri's eyes was not. You can grasp this, can't you? It's what I've taught you about the established meaning of words like possession or soul snatcher. Pakoda rewinded the organic memory viewer in his head and looked again, this time in a memory of this closing's rattle night, at the eyes of the Grump King, ten feet ahead of him, sat upon a log that some sweet men had made from a tree at the king's request. His eyes, apart from looking, did seem or sense to be looking out of themselves, but what looked back at him? It occurred, rather bizarrely, to, Baca <laughs> to Baca's apprentice, that one can never look out of their own head. The eyes are already looking for you. Whomever looks out of your eyes is not you. It felt for a moment like there was two of him walking on the town's edge. One was the body that was christened Placota, a snoozy in word meaning pre-told waker, at his birth in the teepee-like sweetman structure where his mother let him go. For most, this happens once at birth and once at death, the death of the mother, not the child, that is. And the other Placota was the thoughts inside of him, the subject of this walk, the star of it. The body just steps forward, untrying. Yes, I see, Placota ho-hum muttered in resolution to inner asking, now translated into some degree of apprehension. He stepped a pace ahead of his lumbering, older, but somehow also much younger teacher, and opened the plank plank on a hinge that doored the shaman's residence. The shaman's residence is located on the outskirts because they have to hear the deep woods and the shallow woods with equal attention. Strang ca strange calls and ordinary baby sobs intermingling in the remote cylindrical room of what was considered the shaman's home. Even if being a dirt room without mates off in other annexes of a building not there. Because it was a lone room with no others, and if a room is built alone, then it's a home. Well, that was Baca's ancestor's philosophy about all this, anyhow. 
a way of explaining to the new shaman in the line why he'll be sleeping and eating in a contrapment the size of a crib again as a grown man. A serf would like to add or a woman to appease its rulers here by appearing morally in the right, by posing as such. But the sleep kind had not yet been through enough cycles to get over the nag winding of the sexier sex and discern their real and true value as a real girl. So, as part and parcel of their age, the age Baca knew to be ending, gradually or quickly or both at once, women do not sleep in the mud hut on the town's edge, and they do not visit sublunar astral dimensions to learn about the mind of the rainforest, and they do not drink psychedelic brews or facilitate the drinking of psychedelic brews. They are not shamans. They are caretakers and storytellers who lips offerings were considered as valuable as their never naughty bits. But the men just can't be bothered to listen long enough to get to that point, and that what they consider a shrill tone that all of them seem to speak in. Pakoda reached a hand into the onset and heard some of the textual context of his world, and taking from the chatter a theme, the woman manufactured a myth instantly through his brain, drawing from the cosmology he was installing from Baca's past into his mind, and also from what he had learned from Rattle Knight, the myth grew into an abbreviated form. All women were possessed by a very annoying spirit who wouldn't shut up. You know, sometimes I hear you. Baca had been studying Pakoda's shift to the facial expression, correlating to indwelling activities on another plane, made cinematic in the lantern's range of simmer, placed in hot center next to a few mounds of books angularly toppled about the dirt floor and disorganized drooping stacks. What he had meant, which Pakuda knew without asking, which he didn't this time for once ask, was that he had heard Pakoda's lewd and insensitive incomment about the sleep last female population. Slightly embarrassed, Pakoda eyed Baka back and saw his stern front give way like loosening foundation to absurd guffawing. Baka was more familiar with laughter than any body Pakoda had met. If he was more grown, he would laugh too, but he was still young, half-grown, and it was never acknowledged nor admitted that he, what he really had left was envy, a desire for more laughter. His world was heavier than Baca's, and yet Baca's was full of predators, or at least strange ghouls with hard-to-pin motives. A piece of him in him, or a piece of something, felt gypped, and he wondered whether Baca himself was concealing his true nature in a like fashion of the indwellers, who hid their operations from the sweet mankind. If Baca was keeping something to himself, perhaps a whole other planet that he lived on, and was partitioned from Placota by, an adjacent and bladder planet in the Big Bod's Big Bod, whatever superorganism contained theirs, the sense of injustice and the lower or more embedded habit of comparison, comparing himself to the teacher, who, like the best of teachers, was primarily a friend, someone he could meet on level ground, which was subtly never allowed by the Grump King and his officers in denial. To them, he was an underling that they were only required to formally refer to as a brother and an equal. For Baca, that charade was not a charade. It was a genuine respect. So why did Placota compare? Maybe Baca knew something about him that he didn't yet know about himself. That was always his conclusion. Do you really think Brother Jacques, as large as a lizard's pisspot as he is, would forfeit our dignity to the conquerors? All that Jacques has is pride, dignity, veiled insecurity. It is the mainstay of leaders everywhere, Pakota, insecurity. Knowing oneself to be false, but exerting each and every effort to prove otherwise to oneself and to the public. His values have changed since the last rattle night. Then he would sooner have fed the kids to the white men. Which white man, that is, one can never be sure. Perhaps the same one indwelling in every white guy ever. But instead of having that annoying voice of the one woman on earth, the one white man on earth just blows things up and breaks about his, for purposes, unimpressive bio-wang machinery. And to sum up all the white man's activities behind the scenes of the Big Bod's given moment appearance, presented to the, to the mites and the scurrying mitochondria during each new opening, he is putting up a front. 
then bend over to their impositions on us, and to become enamored and spell-locked by crinkly vagreen paper slips like they have been too long ago, to forfeit plants or at least author their place in our hearts, and an old grump's quote-unquote group path all to money? Ugh, Spriggs and Springs, Pakota, can you really buy into all that? Baca receded to what would have been another room of the tiny enclosure in another life, but it was known to both that he still anticipated response while fiddling with whatever was so important in the shadows of his bed and the fly net draped over it. No, no, I guess not, Baca, but what can we do, you and I? Nobody else even believes that the indwellers are real. By this time, Baca had returned and was holding a many-page tumor volume of some variety above his wine band and tucked beneath his shoulder in a pit. He spindly and noodly, but not in the rigid spance of old men elsewhere, who seemed haphazardly put together due to failing relationships between body parts and desubstantialization caused by their location in life, that is, on the way out. No, Baca's skinny but soft elk exoskeleton owed to some uneasily comprehended relaxation. His muscles didn't carry the hurts and sobs of what his parents had participated in doing to him. His ligaments didn't snap into crooks fast from detention of lost years, and years already found. His face seldom, if ever, revealed stress. These aspects of the dance of Baca's small movements gave the impression that he had been let in on one of their real mother's best-kept esotericisms. One of the passcodes tuck slipped into creation before the cycles ever began, when everything was still or just not yet, and that whatever it was in Baca that Mr. Baca had learned from her, it was something that had eased the tricky spindler's spider web of feelings stored and displayed in the body that was and is himself Baca. Surrounding some topic that all of them on the outside of Baca in the secret secret were consumed with concern and stress over without even knowing the object of their beneath sea inquiries. The tomb that Baca was laying out was a sort of ragged journal, twice times the size of any practical journal ever hemmed or sold. And Placota recognized as Baca flipped the first page, which is also called the front cover in white speak, a slew of handwriting in Baca's hand, and possibly his ancestor Boko's and Beaky's, all contributing ostensibly to whichever main theme the notebook as a totality had long since been dedicated to. To the right, by a tidfly's whiff, Placota saw some words formatted on the page of the voluminous volume, which itself was not co cooperative to prospective readers, because it had decided to transform slowly into dust and leave behind its bound form. What they had here was just a half-dust and half-tomb form. By formatted, the onset simply signifies spaced in place, where these few words with prominence, and so they must together, the title of Baca's book, be this, the understudy surmised, a compendium of floratic knowledge regarding the rulers of this realm. This was the first potential title candidate that jumped out but never moved from the page. And seeing that Placota was processing that slice of his treasured work, Baca explained, my very eldest predecessor, a shaman named Buku, that came before Biki's time, wrote the initial title of our compilation, and thus, because he had fallen in love with a proper woman from the mainland, who had come with that time's conquistadors, he wrote very often in a pen tongue that had the flavor of a English snobrod. Baca drew effortlessly from his infinite supply of ha-has, which Bakota knew must be coming in from other realms, and manifesting themselves in Baca's throat to have a sound as jovial as Baca or whatever was inside of Baca laughing away. Nothing in the forest is that sunny, not naturally anyhow. Each punctuated gleeha seemed inundated with something of the supernatural, that slab of the all-map of nature which pertains to the big bod's thoughts, and not the reveries of its little sweetman living tenants. Baca's finger had lowered seductively, not seductive in the pen tongue of Pakoda's reproductive system, but seductive for his imagination. And it rests now at what must have been a second or replacement title to the first, left to the name in the annex index amalgamation for the Bikis and Babas and Bobos, who preferred language and address of unrefined baboonery sooner than a tea sipper's mannerisms. 
The second title was The Indwellers, A Record of What is Known, and Baca could see that this one was less neurotangly for his frequent hutmate or guest. Uh, after Buku died, uh, uh, some invasive strain of chronic diarrhea slagged him off Ploco, uh, by the way. It, it was the indwellers behind it, though, I know it. My research, he eyed the book sprawled into two half-books and corrected his oversight upon catching side gaze of the Baba Biki Bobo books list of BB named contributors. Oh, sorry, our research. It seems to imply that the indwellers can, under certain conditions, influence, but not cause disease. Baca stopped towards the bottom of reading his family tree as captured by the inner cover's authorship log, and returned to what Pakoto is still marveling at the shaman, and, and, uh, which is what understudies do as long as they remain understudies, marvel at the accomplishments of men and women that they assume or are influenced to assume greater value in than themselves. The place Baca was looking as Pakoda was looking at his looking could best be bestimated as Buku, and Baca finished with, uh, like our Buku. What about you? The younger one was compelled by something or by himself to say, Have you ever suffered stuff like that, Baco or uh, Baca, at their hands? More from the endless Gaffar grab bag. Baca shook his head with a smile. That was really only a toll booth without much a fee for escaping giggles. The most they ever do to me is re-enter, but once you know what they're up to in there, in your body, the lashes can never carry as much pain weight or strike much beneath the skin. You or whoever gets to that point where they understand a little more, they are protected by our real mother and given provisions at dark dangerous turns. The obvious question was whether or not Buku had failed to establish the sort of awareness that this new cycle shaman, Baka, had achieved, and thus remained more vulnerable to health defects manipulated by other beings. But Pakoda, for another once, refrained from asking. What is it that wants to ask, and why does it need to know? Pakoda wondered, merging with the onset out of conversation's earshot. If it wasn't Ploco and Ploco, and it wasn't the Grump King and the Grump King, how could he be sure that it was Baca and Baca? The degree of espionage and unknowing implied by the cosmology that Pakoda had been downloading from Baca's brain for nearly 20 years seemed unbearable. What is what is enough on its own, let alone who is who? That was supposed to be easy. It was supposed to be as simple as pointing a finger and recognizing. But it wasn't, according to Baca and or the being who lives in Baca Boko. Who is who is all but certain on Baca's planet. And he understood now why his fellows had halted at the doorstep to the portal which would bring them there, the ripple into Big Bod's regions through which each sweetman and sweet blast could transmigrate to a better place, Baca's place. It was the comfort of knowing who as who that kept them from entering further, and the love he had for them made its note of understanding this. But Pakoda had to self-admit, the hardest thing for the sweep kind to do, that for whatever reason, the reason he was conceived with, he wanted more than anything to migrate to switch over from his world to Baka's, and on some level that was his hope in spending so much of each opening and closing in the man's presence around his quirky blatherings and schematic-like doodles. Do you have one, an indweller? Is that what you're perplexed by? Well, there goes the most discomfortable of the nearly without finished stream of questions that arise on the doorstep of Baca's fears. The sphere that waits until the more easy questions have been cleared by security, cleared of any threat of challenging the prevailing belief assumptions of the mind contacting this new world. Do I have an indweller? Do I have a mysterious entity in my body pretending to be me? Do I want to know? That Third part, whether or not a sweet man ever wants to know, given what they do happen to grok in from it all, is a place where most stop and re-resume their serfhood for leaders who stay leading, by never giving to honesty about whom they are, a leader. All the worst tyrants work upon prospect slaves by giving a convincing impression of a buddy you drink with often. But even a buddy who is really a quote captor dashing towards omni control is an easier sell to an inhabited sweep folk that doesn't want to know than self knowing. 
that it, the dynamics of why this is, why the pull to ignorance is so strong in the inhabited state, has been espoused upon by Baca one closing, inside the anything hut that the residents had agreed to be a mutual space for whatever each was doing which couldn't be done without each cycle feeling the same within a sleep kid's personal hut. Old Shaman's nose had been infiltrated voluntarily by several squadrons of snuff sent out by Baca's hand and long breath to directly meet his brain, and had been snuffed chatty afterwards as a result, Lakota recalled. What had high Baca said? Funhouse images of moving things in the vicinity at the time kept on crowding in on the content of what was said and unsaid that night. A sleep last youped fine drunkenly and arousingly in another enclosure. A subwind of full one a full wind was singing tenor or soprano, or just dropping its falsetto momentarily, and the forever brigade of bold toads croaking, all these things were factors in Poco's memory of the, that night. But whenever he sat in on remembering what had been shared with him post-snuff about the inner methods of an invading spirit and covering over and making the host to desire the covering over of their consciousness, something else seemed to fiddle with the control stick in his head, and the memory forgetfulness barge just wouldn't budge. All this time Pakota had assumed, had been programmed to assume, that the most common amnesia of sweet folk forgetting weared on in his body as a consequence of some improper diet. He still indulged in an occasional soda that the conquerors had left behind littered over their campgrounds. And perhaps he had preassumed that to forget is an incidental limitation of just the type of body that a sweet man has. Could that be how the indwellers did it? Their inhabitation merely masked as all that could be called normal ways. And his dreams at night, just a distracting camouflage for their intrusions, Pakota went blank and forgot to continue. Do you still hear me? He asked the shaman. Baka looked around and pretended either not to hear him or to hear someone or something else, and then abruptly darted back at Poco, as if he had just now dawned upon himself that he had a guest in his home who was speaking. What he was saying by saying nothing at all is that he shouldn't say. Some answers are detrimental if one hears them without being ready to. Some have just been historically hard to say. They will not be hard to say forever. In his private quarters, the Grump King had sequestered himself, as is a Grump's way, off from the proverbial picket signs, the rallying and co-awareness of each other with the sweep folk. He, as at every qu closing, hung up his invisified crown, and at the same then the crown of his kingly identity, too. And some part of him that was still Brother Jack, Elder Jakiri, and not the Grump King, was at last sitting up on and over the side end of his sweeping slab. His mud hut was no nicer than the publicly available real estate of snooze, but it would be someday, so long as the merchant and wealthy buyers in the Nowhere City marketplace were as enchanted with the sweet folk's embroidered washcloths, jewelry made from twisted hemp root, and heck, one day soon the recorded hymns of his people would be commercially available on cassette, or whatever the wider world had to boast in options for listening to their songs and they would have connections in the black market for distributing puff snuff, coca leaf, psychoactive brews, and green puff. If the conquerors made the niche fashion out of the sweet folk that he hoped his people would become. What kings don't understand and never have been yet made to understand is that even a serf can only become an accessory in the surface of appearances. Beneath the grand fib, they were gods, albeit gods of self-dishonesty, but that could change at any time. To himself, in the onset, he felt misunderstood. It wasn't that the last remnant of Cycle 4's ungoverning government had given up on the slumbering to the side sad sacks that he could feel through the ever-thinning, ever-thickening walls. On the contrary, he had discovered an enthusiasm for their future, the future that, as the undelegated, non-appointed decision-maker, he could help to plan by himself. Among the pervasive delusions of leaders is their faith in ever-changing what's going to happen anyways. But running a campaign that looks to the Big Bod's true form and says with it that which will be, will be, doesn't serve to muster morale for envisioned marches of the future. 
that leaders privately imagine or image with everybody else at once. Constructed in the same headspace where they often also imagine draining the assets of charities, or less dramatic, horrendously, but fittingly small and unseemly in scope, charting moves to make a lower ranking vulnerable by unconscious choice, holes in their, his, cabinet. The attachment of the hole is not so important to him as the enticing hole itself. It varies for madmen and kings everywhere. In that same senile closet, in old men's repository fantasy lives, the fate of all cycles are drafted up. A global network of stunted elders of all tribes, measuring environmental fallout adjacently from, and probably less fervently than, in cubbies devoted to booze and hatred. The Grump King had simply awoken one day to a change in his views about the conquerors. The change in views he himself could never account for. It accounted for itself, but its occurrence was now trailing back towards the bend of the last cycle hop. Over and happened. No going back, so said the king voice in his head. Besides the missed occurrence of view change, the great, by tradition, elder had also encountered more ease in changing the views of his cohorts by some strangely acquired invisible influence. Before this closing's rattle night earlier, they had seemed to have more of a backbone, or more likely they had all co-imagined that they had, and it was just finally starting to show their shared delusions, that is, to the extent that they needed his influence before changing for his purposes. Anyhow, their fear did that for him. They had been made to work for the king's purpose because of the overlap between what he offered in exchange and what they imagined to be their own desires for the future not yet tainted by his requests. By coercion and heeding loss of comforts, those rights he provided them with to begin with in the past cycle of no relevance, those sovereign individual members of not only Snooze but the wider world had aligned and adjusted their entire compasses to another man's compass, another being's agenda. Even Lotus, who instructed the youth on meditation and the right fruit of non-attachment. King Grump insinuated that he would take meditation and mediation away, and that was that, fear one Lotus. But the mudflower left would see financial compensation for his bending over, as we all do. Besides, Jakiri resolved, if the settlement was really in danger, we would see the piling up of traces of that danger all around us. Of course, he assumed, as is the powerful's nature, or what was left of it, that he would be able to see the danger for all of them. Doing such was what they had all paid him to do, after all, paid for with the ego currency of bending over, always. And especially in the case of grandiose forces that Crazy Baca describes, an invasion of another race, but in our bodies and minds, we'd see it. Jakiri caught by and suckered into his inner narrative drama as usual, as are all powerful men, put on a little show for himself alone then, and looked all about his standard issue barren rock pebble and weed mud floor, acting as if, how else, he was searching for the tyrant Baca had long, been, long since been warning snooze of and couldn't find him. One recalls the odd revel uh, revelations of Ploco, or an extension of them, that one can not only not see out of their own head, but therefore that one can never see oneself without reflections. And due to the limitations inherent in this setup, the reflections are bound to be mistaken for something or some force else, even when they really are coming from someone else. For a few open shuts, which fuzzed out into other open shuts eventually, the atmosphere and snooze into its edge was relatively hygienic, Cleansed of indweller blasphemy anyways. Children made cart routes to and from Nowhere City daily, occasionally having to sleep in strangers' homes if the work kept them too late, and rising beasts had made their return commute non-travelable, not imagined to be safe, until the next opening. Baca ceased making late appearances in the Anything Hut to rail blow lines of snuff and educate the populace on the spirits. He remained to his own, which from familiarity had come to include the sporadic company of Placota as well. And when the unofficial, unofficial officers of the law of bending over, which until then had never existed obviously in Snooze, went to check on Baca's chosen activities out there on the edge of Snooze, 
He had a satisfactory amount of potion and spell work prepared to present them with in his dishonor. The traditional cyclical shamanistry was ready at hand to act as an alibi and prove that he had not been further pursuing his intensive studies of these other beings. Quoco, hearing about the visit later on, knew that whatever traditional work Buck had presented that committee with, and him through the council committees, was likely just junk not yet thrown away from previous less refined, less important eras of the individual man's curiosities. Sometimes a man who is all alone in knowing a secret must deceive in the ways of those who don't know, to live to fulfill his or her the below cultural layers of Poloco's mind reminded. Purpose. Pakota realized this now, but couldn't fit it to the shape of himself, his behavior. Only Baca's example of a for Poloco to still to be discovered, self-autonomy. The ends justify the means. That saying was made somewhere for individuals like Baca, not the drones, because the sweep kind could be made with their own permission as established to serve ends other than their own. Perhaps it's better to say, the ends justify the means if you know the end you're serving. Any organism under ordinary, fully natural conditions does not ever deviate from that organism's intended function and deeper purpose. Knowing this deep down, the basis of the argument for transmigrating to Baca's planet becomes clearer, or within touch, because any sleepman organism can understand how it feels to deviate. But if it were only the organism, the sweetman, you or I, who votes on its own course, this particular understanding and this particular deviation would never ever arise to begin with, to begin with in a cycle everyone forgets, having never been but heard of, from their elders' oral testimony on every previous rattle night. This relative relatability of the deviation would never occur, never be made known. So, using the underbones of white speak everywhere, sensibility, sense as defined as how sensibly a sense candidate relates to lines of thoughts and words inherently nonsensible, it follows, nonsensibly, that something has caused a deviation to be made known, to exist at all. Baca says that we know this deviation because the spirits take residence in our bodies and as our minds. And so all of our experience becomes two minds warring at one another, two minds superimposed over one another, two minds determining two wills, which can never agree on what they should will towards. It wants activities, Baca concluded, even by his own admission not understanding their motives that support its connection to the sweetman vessel, while the inhabited sweetman, which Baca says they all must be, or else they wouldn't be sweet folk at all, desires activities which will dislodge the inhabiting spirit, but is occluded by the spirit about how one could ever do this. Two experiences of the world running alongside and on top of one another, in each sweet boy and sweet girls and mysterious other beings bodies simultaneously. Baca says that we don't know self-conflict, we only translate it as such, or chalk up the symptoms to to any source that we are made to suspect but never find. That from Cosmos height, self-conflict looks just like conflict with others, all except for that it's inside of one body. Baca says all of our battles with ourselves are really battles with an alien spirit which is living in us. The council rules are the council within the council rules that Baca is an undiagnosed bipolar or schizo. Words received from the encyclopedias the conqueror sometimes brought through with Bibles they supposedly read and understood much more importantly. One opening, a day crept into their reality slab of what had always been referred to as open and shuts of cycles. The open and shuts and their cycles were turning ever less convincing as more new shit was introduced as news from outside in the wider world. A child came carting back from Deep Wood in Nowhere City, located semi and in semi outside of Deep Wood, and had brought a spawn of the Conquerors with it. An anthropologist flown down from some another sub-earth up north, studying these sweet, pe- sweet people. 
tailed back to the settlement with young Pudge, who had told him at the offer of a coin the kid called Shiny, all about their land. Pudge was much less certain how to answer about their culture. To them, that was just like taking poos too, a natural movement or perhaps a natural discomfort. While shining their professor's shoes, sourced from labor of those Pudge's age, Pudge felt almost tempted to ask where to apply. He offered Pudge her candy in return for travel, but would tell the waiting sweet folk that he granted her her solace by ex escorting her safely through the wildness, as whites in Nowhere City called it, a wildness that the anthropologist professor knew less about zero than he did about, say, sex and drugs. Fun prevents study, his inner voice always used to tell him, a fill-in that not one sweeper would buy into, of course. The adult sweet manity were well aware that every kid born in snooze knows their way around the deep wood, but then, in the unspoken contraries domain, if they had thought on it a second more, if they knew how to be self-honest, they might have asked when it actually was the last time that they went out on that trail. But around about exactly there is where the fright produced silence for reeling starts to entice the coward again, and an in-living hand motions onward. The anthropologist professor had, after enough plant source burp brews to forget his childhood for the night as his white spoke it up, felt pseudo-confident enough to ask Baca, who he found fascinating, a kind of teacher like himself he fancied, about the conquerors and the more emotional aspects of the burp brews working on him, even went to put it to Baca if he hates him, specifically, and then embarrassed at his fraudy and slip, and Alden edited his action to if Baca hates his kind for all they did. Baca explained reassuringly after shaking the head as if to say, there's so much you don't yet see, that the professor's whiter people, the one white man on earth, and the others, if there were any, which Baca was always keen to suspect, not assume, that there likely are, were not at fault nor in blame. Sitting on a patch out in the open air, in just this spot, leftover soda cans were still left trashed about in the same spots where the one white man had pillaged, taken what they wanted, and shown zero empathy, it would seem sensibly, to the sweet folks' kind and snooze as a whole. But Baca, always providing the onset contrary of voice, the counterintuitive, or truly intuitive, intuitive without any on handicaps, perspective, had seen beyond all that. The plastic wrappers aside, he still saw those and wondered when the non-real massacre after cleanup agency was planning on coming back. Instead of the non instead of the now long gone conquerors themselves to remove the pig grease containers and aluminum burp brew can piles. His guess, half humorously, half actually, was that the cleanup would arrive when the tides literally came. The floods, as Sister Panther had warned him of during a far out on the edge waska sesh. The conquerors, or the whiter fools in attendance, had asked Baca why, uh, why Baca was moved by something to tears. He had replied, for you and then us and then the wide world, I cry. For the animals it is already, or I wholly hope, almost too late. More of a shaman's work is with heart to the animals than has ever been publicly and said speak admitted. Tell me, sir, Baca, a little more, but somewhat more than mumbled across the grass patch to the other teacher. The brew has a philosophical effect on Baca. Shamans at all times are shamans because their deep body makes more creative use of drugs. <laughs> and then also, or in joint, in fact, with day-to-day -day opening to opening mundane experiences. Up, shh, he's speaking now. If you had a herd of hens, the professor, who was too quiet to always live up to that title, professor, was long gone to overly inebriated to a grimace, as usually he at the classification of a flock as a herd of hens soberly would have worked Baca down to at least a gaggle for future sensible reference. And the herd, Baca eyed the currently non-professor whimsically, jabbing the sort of personality structure and dweller functions he knew well that half of that man must have. 
but the burped out whiter guy hadn't noticed, evidently drunk enough to semi bypass some personality traits or indweller habits. What if your birds contracted a mysterious tapeworm, yes, and that parasitic tapeworm could direct or at least pervert the flock's every move? He did notice the correction of white classification to flock, and then looked uh, like he might take an artificial any berry flavored lolly out of his pack to congratulate Baca gold star like on the correction, the way that all beings congratulate each other in the habited state, gingerly to avoid setting off unpleasant triggers, indweller reactions, in which the indweller and its perspective become dangerously visible, dangerously identifiable to others who are looking. All in respect to the one law and all on governing governments, the t firm taboo of not bending over for daddy in whichever form he takes. Or these parasitic tapers disrupted the every attempt of your chickalees to move of their own will, at most allowing the birds to act half their way and half the worm's way. Something appeared to wriggle under the drunk whiter man boy's skin at the mention of this. Baca feigned not noticing, as he was used to, having to himself deceive in the way that indwelt folks do, by pretending they don't notice the real stuff of experience. They hid it away in the onset. If that was the case, and one season came where the chickens started pecking each other, trying to rid themselves of the tapeworm, would you blame those birdies? Dr. Viewpoint, the prof's non-professional title, the prof had profed earlier in the introduction. He was well past drunk now, to use white-er terms. But he was drunk past half of the words inside him, too, by that notch of the open-shut cycle, or day. The two were mixing together in his sublingual realms. The prof's, that is. When you have an indwelling dick who likes to make sense of everything, by groundless claims hiding thinly veiled beneath the indwelling dick's logic, as the whiter rays tended to, to attract, Baca had noticed that. Uh, the sweet folk were opposite and had indwelling nature poets who captivated the sleepyhead with flowery and loose, wide-reaching mind myths, so tempting as to make the sleepyhead want to believe, buy into, sell their souls for. What would trigger and possibly dislodge a whiter folk's spirit parasite was what would sustain one of theirs. No wonder then that conquering business. Rounding back around, blurred borders liberated sensible folks, and firmer lines liberated dreamy folks, by confusing the shit out of all of them. Under brew-flapped semi-liberation, Leslie, Dr. Viewpoint's first name, sensibly speaking, was able, not knowing it but doing it, to tap into the onset, and brought something back from the onset aloud that Baca actually had never considered in years of inner research. Entirely by accident, of course. Those unexposed to intellectual or spiritual or mixed both puzzles are many times more prone to finding that puzzle's contours and ridges, missing pieces left back in the box, the pieces visible on the table came from, to feel into places in code illusion that the more exposed had already become so familiar with, so familiar as to never even suspect. Well, Bach, my birds must have allowed that them parasite into them, even on a very subconscious level, the same level on the onset where the prof would really hear his own implications and possibly also pick up interference from his kind, begging forgiveness of themselves for hurting from hurt, from hurt, from hurt. Baca's eyes lit up. That was soon before he finally figured it all out. High Cosma's view of this conversation would reveal a gradual collapse of the borders between the conversation itself and the conversation beneath it, between heaven and earth. It was quiet on the settlement or town's edge, and even when together Baca and Pakoda were often as alone, when there. It was where Pakoda had learned everything that he knew. It was where Baca's ancestors had been keeping and now and then divvying out helpings of occult, shamanistic, trans men mist knowledge for cycle upon cycle. Box, what did you mean that all cycles will end? Poco cod leisurely across the one-room home, 
over the toilet where one of them would often awkwardly relieve themselves of too many berries, while the other, whomever one it was at that time, uh, plays that they weren't corner-gazing at them doing it. Baca on the distant wall's side, sorting through reference books madly, in preparation, it seemed, the scene looking somewhat altogether like a sleepover being held by a young man on one side, either stoned or just managing to forever stare at a speck on the ground for another reason, and a lean, old, scraggly man having lost his keys, or the sleep man equivalent to keys, open sticks, in wherever it was that Box was looking. What I meant by my prophesizing, huffed Baca, is that, okay, the conditions of each and every cycle ever cycled through and back again have always been manipulated by and tinkered by the rulers of our ru of our world. Huffing Baca huffs more and more. And so that when the finale comes, when the indwelling visitors are exposed, when the starry owl which hides the hidden from us all succumbs to a change of role, sharing all that has been veiled with folk folks of all kinds kind, when that all shift occurs... There won't even be Baca's snuff paranoia and also reasonable paranoia joined a moment, feeling he may have gathered in some rustling outdoors beside his hut, but returned after strung out head sweeps all over a few times, looking like Jakiri would have looked from outside, pretending to seek the tyrant in his home. There will be no longer the same type of place here or on the planet, I guess you could say, Poco, ever again after the invisible is integrated into the visible realm and the two halves of reality's mind and their envies of each other are at last resolved. Life on Earth, from Earth, has always been defined by intervention from half-visible forces. And in the new world, on the other side of Baca's planet, it is, I mean will be, evidently living between times, between old and new, caused Baca to mix up exactly when this would occur for a second. A time for individuals, and by necessity of creation, the age of kings is finished. Again, Baca being as much individual as anyone could be in his time, in sleep folk cycle time, had seen the king's age end in his private life. The life lived out of the Grump's view long ago. So how do you explain the Grump King, Blakota noted astutely, the reason Baca kept him in rotation of all open shuts and sometimes soon day dialogues? I'm working on it, Baca instant plied sharp flatly with the obscure hinting characteristic of mystics and authors who happen to be mystics. Even still young Ploco, fully grown Ploco would not still be Ploco, had heard conspiratorial whispers of Armageddon, Mabes likely from rubbing forearms against the one white man that when they checked in, for less shitty drugs and exotic sleep women. Maybe he heard of Dune's dump from his own mother before a whiter conquist took too many less shitty shaman drugs and totally freaked and raped and slewed the jungle woman. Yaska, Snuff, and Greenpuff are not to blame, but the whiter pusses lack of long exposure to blurred borders. It's hard to say and always hard to determine origins of views. Trying to do that has always submersed the investigator in a fucked nightmare circus realm, full of possible culprits, the Queen of Eggland, general used pediatrician who may have performed this or that extra special exam, all sat alongside God himself, the supreme of all culprits. Poco had also been told by the blanthropologist Dr. Leslie Haha Viewpoint that there had been a strata of life on this old planet far back and that what his people seemed to be a crater-sized torpedoing rock had done all the lizards into dying. Given that hysteria history, it was hard for Bakota to even imagine an end of the world. Baca would ask, which world is this end in reference to? Pakoda Feathery felt the same about a beginning. Baca would ask, I hear you again, Baca interjected, huffed to a pulp, just looking for something still. He must not know how to stop. Perhaps the remedy to Baca's indweller is to really, really stop looking. And I don't mean to intrude into your own thoughts, Plo, but it is not our real mother whose end has come, not the world. You know me, I'd ask which world. 
Poca Poca felt sudden deja vu, sleep speak, a double happening. But the second world within our world is on, is on death row by the time master's sentence. Whoever master's time, plo, feather, reflected, hath, and thon said, must be fucking with me, with us all. He had picked up fuck, by the way, from overfearing the banshee youp of his mother's murderer in the act. But then when he realized what he had done and who afterwards, but still felt fuck as a great word. Linguists in the North would simply agree with him there. Siggy Fraud would scream, Oedipus, Oedipus. That word gathered even more so during a formative phase through a traumatic event involving the savage, demonic debauchery of his mums had become so fond to his tongue. I told you, Plo, everything we can see is like two minds quarreling. One of the twin bears perceives, perceives and compares perceptions. One of the twin bears just sees what the first sibling perceives. The firstborn bear who perceives is ill and dying. It is he whose time has come. And how do you know that? Baca returned to his shuffling, then crooked over his facing shoulder, mutterishly finished, you will know, as I do, when I do. What I know, I know from Sister Panther. She says that the twin bears were meant to be identical twins, when they were in our real mother's world womb, but that the first bear who perceives had a mutation. Word gap chuckle. Sister Panther joked that our real mother must have picked up smoking star gas during pregnancy. Word gap moment of realizing one is lying. Okay, I made that one, and Sister Panther growled at me angrily and bore her teeth, but I think she secretly felt it was an awesome line. The perceiving bear is in fatal condition because of a birth defect, is the summary. Sister doesn't know or wouldn't divulge if this defect is in the firstborn twin bear or secondborn. Baca scratched as a hungover prof might or did, attempting a salvage of the drunk gabs and brew doings of a previous night they'd been assured did in fact happen. Gee, I was double domed on Waska, I can't remember. Perps, a control stick was being tinkered with in Baca's portion of the sweet memory bank. But she panther withheld whether the defect was intentional or not on the part of our real mother, saying only that it matters not and that all will prosper save the world that you are accustomed with. I presume she, Panther, meant all of us all there. Just at that moment, a rap knock tap sounded, just gentle brutally enough to fall in between. It was Dr. Leslie Viewpoint and King Grump Jakiri at the hut cut hole. The former of those two, Les, having still yet to return to the nowhere city, and the latter of them two is probably in-popping for any evidence of Baca's deeter-deetering from the king's group path, the terms of his declaration of shit spansion. On impulse and also paranoid from smoking lots of green brush at he and Baca's mock sleepover, Placota had vaulted straight out of the way and plop, horizontal lane on a mud wall where he couldn't be detected by the grump and Leslie. Because Pakota found Leslie's glasses hard not to misread on their small label print etch letters. Each time he read it, close or afar, he could swear to whatever god Ploco Feather had left. Blown so far away was he towards Baca's planet. Baca, perhaps, could be his god. He could swear that the label on the glasses that you need better glasses to read said, Punch me. He wasn't sure, as any deviated sweet folk could sh on surely relate to. Though not in another world where sureness would be allowed, another world still to come. As to what had motivated his hiding, most likely he had reasoned in the onset and on thought that Grumpus Maximus would have associated his being here with Baca's unlawful, still ongoing continuance of currently forbid researches, forbid by him. Or nah, it was another thing entirely, but again he could not say. Maybe he just really wanted to avoid a misreading and misunderstanding with Dr. Snoop Pants punch me by specs. Jakiri phlegm roughed auto bloodily loudly, the way fading kings do, to manifest mock attention. For reference to this image, one could envision four year youngs trying to get deadbeat but productive dads to look up, look over, or just look at me while they're on a semi semi mandatory work call about chipirios that the kids want attention for, or about easy lady worker O's. 
Dad avoids the kid, of course. Jakiri was the serial kid in this scenario, through that hypo-metaphorical other one, and Baka the cheating papa canoodling with a female spirit on the other line. I just brought the doctor by the shaman's hut to showcase our culture's impressive know-how on things like making milkweed thistle soup for digestive purposes. Not lube. Forty lashes if you mention that. The Grump King's side silence hush warned of this on the tip of Crazy Baka's twisty mischief-making tongue that could spring. He would not be lashed like this last cycle, but fear had grown in him now, so safety had shrunk in the zone, and preventative measures grew more grumpy by the day or opening. And other things like that. You know, Elder Baka, it is uh, in the interest of our community, I'm sincerely hoping that Dr. Leslie, the unsaid burst seems almost a moment from canned kingly laughter at the feminine in a man's name, Leslie. The bipartisan bipresence of bi energies in a closed place made Jock the Grump King triggered, an analysis easy enough for a reader to write together into an answer. Huh, cough, uh, Dr. <coughs> Leslie, <laughs> Leslie, uh, I hope he will bring some stories back with him about our plant medicine and his uh, grant-funded, uh, what was it, Les? No need, King remembers King concerns with much less search or strain than surf concerns. Les lips quarter part and almost progress to, I believe I have the word you're looking for, formation, after emitted up. But the Doc Eyes periphery that Jakiri had found said word already, so then Leslip shiz zip shut and wait excitedly for lectures to soon come out later. College. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes, Mr. Leslie's fighting haha pressures. College group. Grant funded college group. They might find some interest or application for a previously unknown, snooze grown medical solvent to use in health huts placed all over North Suburb and spread the remedy all over the wider world. All over is a common Kingspeak mannerism or symptom of an indwelt king. It means to them behind the veil of bullshit how far they want their metaphorical power penis to extend by death. A cheap and false escape. And we, the tribe, could be compensated, Baka. Snooze will prosper. And the undreamed, where daydreams Emma leak Nate from, the old grump was already in his future fancy purchase signed up bed, resting and telling sweet folk to go away and doing none else. Dr. Viewpoint gestured to Kiri to take the introductions easy. Brother Jakiri, I've already become pretty familiar with Baka here. He looked at Baka. I hope that's okay to claim, said Les's eyes. Well, Les's lips faltered, then unstiffened, then unfroze, a lip skim becoming less taut by degrees. He was just sharing the most fascinating information with me on... Oh, no! Baka and Pakoda think together, hearing the other's thoughts too, but not noticing what there's already playing on inner speakers. Information, grumble, on, grumble, what, hiccup, cough, grumble, hybrid, exactly. King Grump excitedly had cut the tid-whittling onwards anthro dude off with the feminine he daren't laugh dress him by, as such a crucial opportunity. Cut off, this was it, he had Baka, he knew. By Baca's here-it-comes demeanor, it was obvious to all, Dr. Viewpoint as well, but not owning context land to understand the dramatic plunge into talks vibes levels, he just assumed that Baca had mentioned banging the king's daughter high on top line snuff snuff, or some other unauthorized caper that he attributed his forgetfulness of to a hangover. But, screamed the Jack still in Jack, why did he, not he, but the he who he worked through, seem so suddenly sicked on Baca, as if he, the Jack Still and the dual Jack slash Lord crossbreed hybrid, was now a hound of the worst of astral vacation spots, trained to smell out the blood of soon to be eaten victims? And then to bite in anyways, and to blood, bone, and heart. What was it that set him the Jakiri half of Jakiri? Assuming Baka was right about the indwelling, against what used to be bro Baka, 
The motivator of all cruelty made no sound, creeping somewhere nearby, in the half year, the unseen, unsaid, unthought. Oh, it was so wonderful, wasn't it, Broccolis? Wow, Broccolis. Placota had a sudden vision of Wesley a few cycles less aged. Standing in the corner looking pathetic at a montage of many, many parties he was brought to as a last resort variety of plus ones. And what have felt La Leaf's Lama Saf Sphere sympathetic here, now, don't cry, start to emerge in his felt Porsche of the Anthelt. If it weren't for the punch me glasses rising in leaps over making more sense. We spoke on, he was going to say it any second now, and Baca, the town's last remaining shaman, would be exiled, expelled from the shit show, where he was most needed, Baca realized. He would be sent out into the deep wood. He wouldn't only be left to die, and that was not his chief concern. Get it, chief concern. Ugh, never mind, the author's lame Leslie must be talking. The one bad pun maker in all nerds is strongly activated. Baca Broomsweep knew the ribbons and twists of the Big Bod well in this region, and would likely not die of any condition apart from separation anxiety out there. The true folk friend Baca would be coerced into leaving the others to die, or at least be influenced, led towards death, to prosper, as he had put it. That is what he had meant to mean, that an indweller can influence, not cause death and destruction or even ignorance. That a spirit can lead towards it, not bring you to it against your will, or at least your bending over. It needs a victim in position. It was exactly as Leslie Viewpoint had countered astutely last closing night, sitting on the patch. And by the way, most crapidemics make their best comments when they have no idea, zero, of what they're about to be talking about. When a crapidemic has ideas about what they're about to be talking about, they become insufferable, make a lot of long, empty hmms, and to summarize. As a crapidemic themselves might say, perhaps someone needed to write the character. We hope that's not me, but our ex. Rough it is to determine the origins of our characters. They say nothing good when they know what they're going to say. If they know what to say, they don't say anything good. But he had said something that he didn't know he was going to say. That the sheep, oh right, Baca and Visidod, it was hens in his talk with Viewpoint. The hens, the herd, let the tapeworm inside themselves. That was it, the answer. But if he, Baca, was uninfluenced in comparison to the other sweet folk by the suggestions of the mysterious beings all around him in the astra illegible air, then why had he been led to this moment of agony? The next words, monsters, Baca Breezy, told me about the monsters last night, Baca. Baca told me about the monsters in your sweet village, Lord Urser. Us anthro lore geeks find folklore and myth lore fascinating above much else. You don't need to be adored, you just need me and any old kind of lore. Les's thoughts recited again, from high school, well middle school, well pre, well college, Mount Murray. It had been on rotation a while on Lonely FM, Station Zero, Campus Weather. King Grump would have right then failed his namesake, Grump, if his grin was a sign of pleasantude and not of celibasking and cold satisfaction. The crazy exile's understudy went with him far out deep, because what else would be left of Placota Feather without his master? Maybe he would return to snooze after having more time to finally get the handle on the same secret which he knew Baca must have kept shushed, locked in a private hut of its own, next to where spiritual men stash their camcorded smut films in the deep brain. Trailing a few steps ahead over the sort of terse shrubbery that would be commercially seen hacked apart by mustaches with machetes in movies, and an ambient din that could be recorded and sold as a jungle-themed relaxation tape, next to Sweet Men Soul Soothers, Volume 69, and eventually Indigenous Girls in the Wildness, same volume number, if Snooze got the opportunity to really be prosperous. But Baca had seemed less and less certain, that is, in the quality of knowing, 
the earth and stone elements in Baca's blueprint that had always drawn Placota into the shaman's vicinity in the first place seemed to be diminishing. The first place, wherever that was, where Poco met Baca Broomsweep, or where Poco learned how to bend over, that is to look up to and at idols, when he was taught to have heroes, to measure himself not with but by his heroes, that could be it, the first place. Baca's magnets were declining in Ploco Pole, but this none had yet self-admitted. It was awkward losing your hero while being his only friend left on any surface of any world. Some steps were even missed, and the old man Baca Sr. began to look his age. The impression of an inner child, Baca Jr., as opposed to Baca Sr., who was now eating shit face first now, was fading. And maybe it never was Baca's secret, Bach's wisdom, Baca's planet, that made his Ploco magnets pull. Maybe it was Baca's surviving youth in a land of gray self-seriousness. And Ploco had a near-terminal case in his heart's ER, needing joy and creativity, inspiration desperately. As soon as the first day passed a blur border of the shallow wood, when old Baca had slipped on a dozed-off frog who went, Rebitch! and tussled then into a Puddles class presentation of what swamps are like. The sight was hard for Ploco. It reminded him of doubts about Baca that were in deep storage. Baca Baca, the man-sized god that he had made into a god-sized man. All for himself, all for fooling himself, for being fooled into the unexpected. In these moments of shared delusion breaking away, he became like the other tribe kids for once. He halted at the brink of discomfort even when truth the truth of Ploco, the only secret he wished to be shared from Cosma now, not Baca's secret, his. Even when that could be hiding there, in the terse shrubs, where serfs can't see past and thus can't see. He didn't ever ask, really, whether or not Baca was really as wizened as Sister Panther. He didn't ever ask, really, if Baca was really Baca. And as the puddle's best guesses sized up into solid swamps around them, winning the puddle prize for near evolution into a body of more, whoa, turn, the colors are becoming dark on moss, and the rainforest hues bounce back that moss light into a fog, not ripe with life, but pseudo-life, the reds that poison berries wear as opposed to raspberries. And the closing hungry beasts had come out from slumber, not that Ploco could see, but hear in <laughs> unidentifiable sound effects. Soon available from Deepwood Halloween's spooky sounds of the wake forest at a commercial retailer near you. Yet, some things are safely assumed true for a while, however very few things there are. It was increasingly important to self-admit for them both, to evaluate what forces had led, not Baca, that was clear, but Ploco, to up and out leave, to relocate from snooze and go into the deep wood. It was time to ask without fear if he himself was working for his own ends or the ends of a mysterious being. It was now or never. So as a good sweet boy, or the shag tatters left of a good sweet boy in him would, he didn't. Son, do you see this? It's just still bright enough by the hour to see clearly, to clearly see. Baca Sr. turned around to face where he was walking from, and wide-waved his arms to an extent, indicating something, some force, all around them too, the way a goldfish would look if it tried to give visual cues, charade-style, with its tiny fins as to what water is like. Not in the rainforest, in your vision plo. There should be little granules, sheets of static, reminiscent of the dead channels of the not-working portable machine which that Dr. Snitch brought to town with him. Yes, Placota could see the granules, over the lush grove, dressing up the omnipresent mosquito and harmonizing in dilation with the everywhere apparently heard bull toad serenade. There was granules, static, a wave of code. Had this code always been an attribute of his vision, it was so obvious now that it had been pointed out by his former master. What is it that keeps us from seeing the most obvious of things, even more than the obscure? Poco registered out of an odd daze that he was bumping against Baca's planet again, and in whimpered by pulling away, progressively pulling less away from landing there. 
As Baca's Poco magnetism failed, Poco's corresponding Baca magnet, which points north to Baca's Poco magnets also north, and thus repels, was failing. That, Placota, is what we sweet men can yet see of the mind of nature, of our real mother's brain. We sweet folk, any folk, it don't matter. We've all already been published into her, written from her. But on some level, Plo, this is all repeats hand gesture with tiny goldfish fins, always being revised. The granules you now see, the distortions over top of your vision, are her thoughts before she applies her latest revisions. Yeah, yeah. Poco Late Breeze sniffled in from profound heart motion, not looking from the tiny, thin fairy blobs of his real mother's mind. That yeah, yeah was by this far the most dismissive, not meant as a comeback, comeback, let be it an utterance that Poco had ever, ever dished out to his now former master. And although he couldn't see yet, as Baca always adds, yet, having promised Ploco that unprecedented views had been on her mind for a very long time, a time before cycles and calendars, to begin with. Through static screens, Plo grew less sure of his eyes, in combination with the closing's diminishing light, to Baca's face look from hearing Plo talk back to his master. Placota Feather knew by the unknown that his friend was smiling. This was another kind of silence. Shapes drifted and resembled phantoms and dead loved ones, and the pools of grainy static running backwards and forwards and along and up and down the screen. He, more grown now, could see them flitting overhead, and if he wondered if that's as much as he'd ever see of the spirits, the first impressions inside the mind of nature. The deep wood was closed and somehow closing around on all sides now, and they both decided to rest at the bottom of the Revalius tree, taken from the pre-Sweeptonian word for revelation. A sky-poking neon-colored rainbow fungalopagus of funky hues, the Revalius, against their backs, like a stone. Undergrass kicking then swimming off from the base of the tree appeared to them to, also at the base, to be serpents, or long snake-like fingers moving over bristles and bumps of imperfected anthills, reaching ever outwards into the uncharted forest, into the unexpected. What was it that you were just saying, Brother Baca? It felt different this time, asking him, calling him brother, an equal. And it wasn't because Baca knows more than Ploco knows for the first time ever. It was because Ploco knows what Baca knows, but Ploco needs Baca to place the words for him, to have the frame to grasp it all with both sides of his unilateral dual self at once, with a full unembrace greater than his two-ness. What was it you were saying about how two minds can be superimposed over the other when an indweller is feeding on us? Which, if I understand, which I really think I'm starting to, Baka, would mean that what we experience, like what we usually do, is like that, right? Because the spirits are the rulers of this world of the living, like you said, Baka. But Baka had not answered, and was shielding, hiding his true face. So strange, like in his hand, so Ploco couldn't see it. And even having not yet seen, it was still, well, different than it was before. This was not the same man he had left snooze with, was it? Was he? There were ugly sounds, like rabies and pencil sharpeners from the shaman teacher's directions. Rabid rat gargle rummaging. Baca's body. It was dematerializing or just beginning to change shape. Things never seen. Poco turned around to run, but there was no path there. There was a mud hut makeshift entry exit way, that one door from the edge of the old town where Baca lived. Cycles. In the in small room, the mud packed gravel soil walls lit up eerily by the central lantern, as if done by a lava lamp inspired by jack o' lanterns. Globs of prisma cave light goo drifting. Hello? That one door opened delicately and in walked. It was him. Ploco, staring unaffectedly across the chamber, as if this was completely fucking ordinary. Hi, Mr. Baca. I came to learn more about the Revalius tree, the tree of revelation. Cold, frozen, inert. You started telling me all about it last week. You all right, Mr. Baca? Are you crashing from snuff withdrawal? He looked younger than he was now, 
and Younger's physical simonym, smaller. And he felt, whoever he was now, looking at that sweep kid he once was, that it was a version of himself, which he had long since parted ways with. It was Placota before he had really met Baca, before Baca had begun to tell him, begun to tell him, so young then and now, such an innocent sweeper then, clueless about cosmology, about the corruption of the spirits who rule their world, before that, about how they actually were a slave race to another species, another species which had their dwelling and the unsaid, the unheard, the unseen, the unknown, and the unthought. In this hut, where Baca had of course gone through a million different theories about his planet, but its core message, its core idea, which he, Baca, had suggested to him, or a version of him back then, whoever was sitting here, that is to be clear, they remained unmoving, a static fulcrum from which all of his wild mentations had evolved over the cycles, was they, the spirits. How many years is of no weight? This original leap was the night or closing, firm words breathe firm worlds, but all that's here is flow, the unexpected, beyond blurring borders, beyond sharp lines, the dark time, where he was first exposed to Baca's secret, to its existence anyways, to the idea that the secret existed. Difficult it is to determine origins of views. But Baca had never told it to any of him. He had only given permission to it and his mind to enter as a possibility, and then slowly, gradually, serpent-like windingly a belief. Maybe Baca, too, had motives of selfishness, implanted by other beings, and had wanted to keep his secret, but the secret really belonged to her, their real mother. All to himself, shut up and never said fully, information to save the world lost to preservation of a feeding intergalactic slug, feeding on the keeping of information, information which belongs to her mind rightfully. A belief must then be a piece of her mind that we never release. It realized. This night, right where he stood, right where he, Pakoda, had stood, was standing now, right in front of him, whoever he was. He managed to turn 360, and when he got there, he looked for Baca, right under the Revalius tree, where he had just been, where something had fallen apart, disintegrated, transformed by decay. In the deep, deep woods, where everything camouflages as everything else, but there was a wall, a stone cut off between the two worlds, no going back. He was back, but not in his familiar life in the village snooze with the fellow sleepmen. But snooze was very, very close, or so he could assume, hearing town motion and gid-gabbly gossip at a distance, through his other thin walls. It felt at least vaguely familiar, this sequestered spot, where he could hear them all, out there. Though, there was no Baca, and there was no Pakoda either. There was just a wall that only non-corporeal entities can walk through. If even they, a wall bordering everything that ever was from this new planet, which, yes, looked a lot like it had looked on the original closing, where he, or a version of him, or a different him entirely, they had stood and been told here once, been convinced of the kind of planet Baca described living on, every body living on, and also about the indwelling, ungoverning government lauding over it. The new planet looked a lot like the old one did, before he ever started looking for another one. He couldn't be sure that it was Snooze out there still, outside, as a deep-sleeping dreamer who suddenly awakes in someone else's room wouldn't be able to determine who the unfamiliar and to the dreamer unprecedented house belongs to without peering down the hallway. All he had to go on was him looking back at him. Two minds. Jolt sadashinally, quick! How cogs come loose right before steam-powered trains go too far off their tracks. An abrupt jash, grind and halter, and then off-roading. Time, all of it, one time as two times synchronizing, starting to play faster and faster, and faster than faster, used to be. He was watching the conversation with himself from long ago take place, and each time Baca's piece of that dialogue came time for it, it was his mouth that moved, his mouth that gave answers, not questions. And he just watched them flutter out, flutter out from the onset like Baca's laughter felt heaven sent from elsewhere. 
Each time words fluttered out, he would give his old young self, young Ploko, the same answers that Baka had given him then, when he was standing where old Plakota was staring from Gaki now. Lips would just move, and nobody indwelling was there to take credit for what the mouth said on its own as the whole body. The spirits rule this world, child, and they tell me that every cycle will come to a single end. Baka had said that, and now he was saying other thats, that Baka had said to him then, tying them together into one synchronized time. They enter our bodies. They can lead us or influence us towards the destination they choose for us. They can nudge us to go in that direction, but they can never make us. That was uh, when the idea of the indwelling visitors had made an entryway out of his head. Right then, that then, that had just passed, and so soon it's far past again. All of his time moving like this, like a plane on a runway, off, off, off for the wider world he had never yet seen, getting ready to ascend over the clouds. Well, what do they want with us? Small Placota, all stumped, as was his nature, or a symptom of deviation from it, asked him. He asked himself, now. They want to make us into what we really are, little me. So don't worry anymore. I know how you worry so. They wear the horned mass as a sacrifice so that we, you and I, don't spoil the good full future that they're building for us all by knowing it all too quickly. That was new, that answer. That was not the answer, or lack thereof, that Baca, whoever he was, now parted forever from he, who was alone on the town's edge, and by a wall beyond, which is only used by happened alreadys, trod over tracks that had become cold, useless, tracks that described, in fact, a kingdom that was no longer there. His young self had some warped time ago made its down way to curl knees and legs in front of him. But it was Elaine present time at his side, unable to handle what was being said that was never before said. The way that salt sprinkles shrivel slugs of certain slug kind, what he had just said which had never and not been ever said before, acted upon his previous younger self, which for the first time he could see. He was not supposed to be able to see his self, but because he was not looking from himself but looking as a grown man, and had as a grown being become altogether different, just for leaving the familiar, for entering the unexpected, then the sleep kid he once was, who was cradled now under flat dirt dust and agony, rolling and clenching itself. The difference made it so that he could see himself. Baca had moved just like this under the tree of revelation in the last world, right before he found the new one, the new world. But he did not step up against the truth this time. He did not cradle. The truth of Ploco, which was there, he went for. There wasn't enough of a connection to all of the lie work of the great and grand fib here that was behind him now in his previous life, too far away. Not enough connection for him to feel any attachment to what elders had taught him was comfort. Writhing juicefully, the skin in the hut glow took such a drastic shade that it overtook the color of the lantern's projections, and haunted predominance of view completely. It was sickly, fading, and then cracks. Riddled with fault line quake cracks, this young boy was falling to pieces before him. Its appearance was terrifying, and it bore familiar character with the grotesque portrayals of demons and devils that the conquerors had come stowed aboard with, as an integral symbol of the false Christianity that they had brought with those devils. But he was not scared, because he was no longer afraid of being afraid. The inputted signal from the other being was there, the fear, the confusion, the splitness, the two-ness, but his buying into it had ceased. He no longer believed of his senses the comments he heard inside. Of this body his mouth opened, and he was zipped back for one last look at the trail, and its long stretch back to his old home snooze where there are sleep folk and grump kings and cycles of cycles. A disheveled, pleading appearing, old Ploco was a few feet behind him on the trail, ahead of where he was looking. Lips began just moving again, and again Ploco listened to himself, he the one leading, he the one following, no teacher in the new world, no kings. It had been like that once, but now the cycle cycle is done, and it is that way again. One of the twin bears perceives, one of the twin bears sees, the one who perceives is ill and dying. 
The tired old sweep kid he was stopped as if receiving unprecedented tragic news, perhaps about dolphins going extinct or children starving. That was the initial look of Ploco as he was then, hearing this. And then, as much and more relief, the dolphins are more bountiful than even their most fond age, and the children have been given food. His face says that much. He can rest now. The wall seals up again and the hut returns, as if a stage show had been going on in here this whole clock sprint. He had ducked out and said his goodbyes, and this room had remained paused, frozen, an ice sculpture in a theater outside of his entire life. That's how it had been waiting for him here, when he reached the tree of revelation and rest in the deep wood, because something in his seemingly minuscule stamped bug existence in life in him was here long before him, and would remain long after. So this deeper life had always been living, hitchhiking, backpacking, ducked under covers, while the shallow woods of his own mind had kept on keeping on. This entire time it had been here. He was waiting for he, but what was left of what was old in him, the young sleep kid Ploco who hugged the hut floor and super hoped it would turn into a cave, like the ones he used to hide from himself in. He hoped he could tell by looking at himself that the ground would turn into Baca, and Baca would know Sister Jaguar's secrets, and he would finally tell him, and he wouldn't need to find secrets of his own to share. That's what he hoped. This here is what would have happened if it didn't happen, the exposure to the belief he realized. The indweller would have been hungry to death, but only happened this way because I lived out the cycle, the entirety of them. Really, I did, inside of this body, and then made my way back to this point without ever knowing, no leader, no follower. What was left on the floor was not human. It was as Baca, the self two steps ahead of the second one, or the man who took that burden for he, had predicted. A tapeworm simulating a sheep's shape, where if you line up an opening in a stencil with an actual example of the shape the mold is imitating, they become nearly seamless but aren't the same. But the cycles were broken now. He had made it to the place where he could understand, and there was nobody to thank, only a body that carried him to where it had just happened. He stepped over the shriveling corpse of what he used to be, and walked out of the far dwelling toward town. He ran into Lotus on the way, who had likely just been teaching children about non-attachment, which he remembered Baca claimed to possess a greater understanding of than Lotus, when Baca was only a spirit disguised as a man. Baca had said, Lotus taught that non-attachment is released from the past in order to get to the present. But Baca countered, as he loved to, no, that's not it. It's released from the present, the past, and the future. The cycles have ended soon. It is forecast in her mind, and I can hear her. That was him, actually, who had said that. He understood that now. He remembered that now. The terrain surrounding the pathway on which shit shooting shot ricocheted back and forth between Lotus and he looked unfamiliar, and the talk increasingly became more so ultra odd, too. Lotus was onto something other than this opening's meditation class now. He was saying something about how Jakiri had been humiliated, that he had summoned the whole sleeping hut round to a meeting in his sleep. Elder Jacques had spoken to the entire population for an hour, or in snooze time, a period, without resolution, foaming at the mouth with deep sleep drool, and in his poo-stained undergarments. Perhaps in a previous world, the ex-serfs would not have noticed, but they did notice, and no one listened to him any longer. The principle of power over others always breaks down when the powerful are seen as they are. Watching that thing which had been with him so long deanimate had proved that much. The prince is a parasite, and the king is a grump. Good riddance. Perhaps both were the same thing. How long Baca had waited for that. There was such joy in him for Baca's victory, but it wasn't really Baca's victory anymore, was it? Baca was how the parasite looked when he didn't know anything. A teacher. Ploca was how the parasite appeared when he knew who it was. He deep knew from within his knowing, by grace of a secret that the Cosma and his real mother had conspired to impart, from before any cycle, that in the old world he could have never seen his self. It was a law, and there were enforcers of that law. But the next is truly new, 
It's a matter of patience. That's it. That's part of what he, not Baca, had said about non-attachment and Lotus. Non-attachment is patience. It's trusting that even when the tyranny takes over, that the ends are okay, will be okay. The ends that you absolutely cannot know are your own ends too. You can know when you're being used, but you can't know what you'll bump into for very long. An urge which swelled with affect, a fountain of compassion tears spritzing back into his underlids. He had to turn around, before it all finished decomposing. He kissed Lotus on the cheek before his run, and Lotus smiled because it wasn't like it used to be. And he had arrived at the who is who and the who isn't who awareness that, that the sleep kid Placota would veer from as cars would veer from icebergs if they appeared through the highway pavement on the way home from seeing Titanic, a movie that Dr. Viewpoint, the anthropologist, the conqueror, the individual, and not just a one white man he appeared as. That was part of the grand fib as so much else was. Les had said that the movie was about a great big freighter that sailed off and never returned. He was sure that they would have different ideas about a fitting end for the film. Dr. Viewpoint would say with pet sensibility, his parasite, that one could infer that the freighter had sunk if it never returned. New Ploco, real Ploco, a real boy, not a sleep kid, would instead have it disappear in the mist. The camera would zoom gradually, frames framing and then frames framed, closer and closer to the mist where the ship had vanished. And in the last shot of the movie, the viewer would see light, kind of a mixture between an opening sunlight and a closing lantern light, glowing warm from the other side of it, of all the struggles and pain, and you would hear survivors, and then the credits would roll. He had turned to run back and arrived. There was no scraps left of his old body. It had been reclaimed and replaced. He had wanted very much to kiss it, just one time, to thank it for carrying him all the way. Instead, he kissed a spot where it would have been and said, Thank you. I love you. Thank you. The spot where he kissed was more real than ever, any of the times he had been here. But then again, he hadn't been, until now. He stepped out and was about to start for town again when, passing by on the right side, King Jakiri appeared, heading towards the deep wood. Brother Jack! Neo Pakoda rang louder than the bull toads. Where are you going? Jakiri said, Oh, hi, Baka. Or was it Pakoda? No, that's right. It was Baka Pakoda. Look, Baka Pakoda. I'm sorry. I feel like I did something unsavory, ill spirited, or cruel to you. He searched his memory, but Baka Pakoda understood that the ex king was really searching for the old world, where he had power, but also shame. His hand went to the old king's shoulder like his lips kept speaking without effort and without trying, to say the perfect ending of each previous point. His hand happened. This all happened. This placeless place happened. The, this more rainforest was only part of it, and the parasites, the indwelling visitors, they were like this sorry sack that stood before him. The old standstool, the young ditz, the serf, the slave, the villager on conditions, the restricted party of the two, and another life bearing continuation backwards from this one past the sealed wall. Without this man, this tyrant, his tyrant, his version of the one tyrant ever, he would never have rebelled and struck out on his own, alone in the uncharted. Without this tired man, he wouldn't have gone. He would have gone unchallenged in his incomplete views, and incomplete views are what is called in white speak believing. But they don't know that much about what they call belief, only having beliefs about belief. Every time Baka Pakoda had ever believed, he had also been duped. The rulers of this world, the dead, the past, are like that, tricksters. His love for the sleep kids was all that was left, and this ex-grump king could see it, was impacted by it, that love. They both knew it, as he had once known when a close friend was listening to his thoughts. Then, he would have asked for verbal confirmation anyways. Not anymore. It, without a perception of it, was enough. He knew. Listen, Brother Jakiri. We were all sleeping back there in snooze. It just happens. Where are you heading off to out there? Jacques shrugged, a sodium sliver of aqua water sneaking past the blown defenses that used to be in place to assure that the Grump King never looked afraid, even as fear itself. All those were gone, and more followed over the broken border, streams. They've exiled me. 
They don't want to have anything to do with authority. They want to be individuals. And all because they saw me in my shit-stained underwear. At that, Baka Pakoda tugged his own loin trousers all the way to where earthworms munch minerals and sang, My brother, my brother from the next world, look all about you. Do you see the granules? Do you see the distortions in your reality? It's like an ocean of information is surrounding us. It is alive and it is nature's mind. There are monsters in there, but we'll see them differently afterwards. My old body wasn't built right. It wasn't built to see itself. But nature has been watching us, and the thought has been on her mind a long time about how and when she's going to save us. The next few addendum completing parts of this wondrous insight, one that was flowing to him as he was releasing it to Jack, an insight happening and being shared at one time, an insight which concluded privately as not thoughts but whispers from knowing, things too hot to give simply by hand. He couldn't tell the king what he knew, he would find it for himself out in the deep wood on his own. But what he knew, oh what he knew. She, his real mother, had rescued him from cyclical time. He had been on her mind, the two of him had, and she had intervened, and made two minds with nothing but each other in common, into more. What needed sermon, what gospel, I don't comprehend, but I will carry it with me out there. The old king index stretched towards the place where forest became lagoon, and street signs stopped being mounted. Whoever he really is, Baka Pakoda nodded and smiled, like Baka used to smile to Pakoda when he knew that he knew. This man does comprehend, but he's pretending. The part of him that comprehends tells the part of him that misunderstands many treasures, that the miscomprehending part can never fully understand. And so he follows it, trusting it, already knowing where he's going. He's going to the nowhere city, but he won't be allowed back like I was. Welp, anyways, Baka Pakoda dreamily butter drawled. I seem to be bad with directions today. The path to town looked nearly as unfathomable as the old king's destination. Could you remind me where Snooze is? He pulled his pants that dropped in solidarity back to loincloth level and waited. The old king stunned stared. Snooze? Where is Snooze? I'm unfamiliar, sorry. If you go down there, down that path, you'll find only the town of Day. Wherever this Snooze might be located, it's not here. I'm sorry. I see. Well, good luck, brother. Baka Pakoda leaned in to hug the old king Jakiri and took him close, so close that if you weren't careful, two people, two pieces could squeeze into one. He began to pull away, and as a sleepkin might feel standing at the above river and marvel gazing at flying fish juggling surfaces, only to lean over the river's edge and see its bed is full of piranhas and eels, there was a tug which was really a holding still of two. And then, limitless horror scrawled on the old king's open face. He stumbled back and st st stammered, wh wh what are you? It, whatever it was, looked back at him, the darkness waiting, and said, It takes many cycles to learn who is who.